Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what are my favorite theorems, a very biased collection as usual. And um, today's theorem has a very complicated name, so I just decided to, instead of calling it what is the XYZ theorem, I just call it what is Bas-Sayer theory. So the, the theorem itself is called the fundamental theorem of Bas-Sayer theory, and I thought this was just a mouthful. Anyway, fundamental theorem of Bas-Sayer theory, and I'm going to explain what this is, and it's pretty cute. So I love it. It's great. I just learned it recently. Thank you so much um, for explaining it to me. And um, whatever, I, I, it's kind of very great in some sense. So it's really good for something like SL2 or certain types of groups. So it's certainly about groups. Um, but in some sense, it's very disappointing in the end because there's a lot of restrictions and limitations, like probably everything has limitations. But in this case, it's it's kind of very one dimensional. Um, which looks fantastic from the from the start, but then you get a bit annoyed because it's just acting on trees and you really want to have a more general setting. But anyway, you can just, I don't want to point fingers here. It's really an amazing theory, right? That's why it's on this list of my favorite theorems. Um, but I just want to point out that it's, it's a bit disappointing in the end. Uh, anyway, so it's still pretty beautiful. So let's have a look. And the point is... Um, the kind of the point is always kind of the point. The point is that's always the point. Thank you so much. Um, is that groups? Well, we learn them somehow as abstract objects, but that's kind of the wrong way of thinking about it. Whatever wrong means. I had a huge quotation marks here. A lot of salt. A lot of a huge pinch of salt. But most of the time, you are actually study groups via the actions. You study certain geometric objects and then you have a symmetry on it. So you have a group acting on it and that, that's how the group arises. And it doesn't arise so often as an abstract group, unless you're studying abstract group theory, I guess. Uh, but anyway, in, in this video, certainly I go for that slogan. Groups should be studied via their actions or we will study groups via their actions. And it will be via their actions on trees. So what is a tree? Well, it's a one-dimensional object, as I said, which is a bit uh, annoying, but okay, fine. It's a one-dimensional object, which is easy to imagine. It's a graph, like this one here, without any loops. So you don't have, uh, or without any cycles. So you don't have something like this, but here, this one is a tree, for example, and so on. And it can be an infinite tree. I'm not saying, certainly not saying, because the theory really works for infinite trees. I'm uh, certainly not saying that the trees are finite. And my standard example, I will have much simpler examples in a second, but I kind of feel like a lot of people have seen this one, is that the free group in two generators, uh, A and B, so just words in A and B, that's that's all we do here, something like A, 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 A B, A, B, and whatever, it acts on this tree because it's a Cayley graph of the tree and the action is given exactly uh, by the color code here. So A acts by going left, what is it? Rightwards. A inverse acts by going leftwards. A B acts by going up, and B inverse acts by going down. So I could put an A inverse here as well because it's a group. But anyway, that's the action on the tree. And essentially, well, coming back to my my flavor here, geometric group theory, and what I'm going to tell you about is somehow part of geometric group theory. Maybe of combinatorial group theory. Maybe a mixture of both. Uh, don't pin me down on it. Anyway, so geometric group theory is essentially the study of groups via their actions on geometric objects, not just random objects. Um, acting on random objects is usually, well, maybe it's actually a good idea. I should shut up here. Anyway, uh, but geometric group theory is the study of geometric actions, topological actions, whatever. We'll do, certainly do the topological flavor in, in this video. And this one here is actually very topological. It doesn't look like it, but if you, for example, look at the boundary of, of this graph, it will be some kind of a Cantor set. So because the graph uh, gets smaller and smaller and smaller, so here it gets smaller and smaller and smaller in each step. So there will be some boundary Cantor set. And then you could think about geodesics in that graph corresponding to the group action and, and all that fun stuff. Anyway, that's not what we're going to do. It will be much easier than that. Um, so it's really just, that's what we do. We act on certain spaces, and in this case, the spaces are trees. We study groups by actions on trees. In some sense, it couldn't be much easier. Trees are, as I said, very one-dimensional objects, uh, but it's still a very rich theory, which is kind of surprising. As I said, one-dimensional, but still rich, which is kind of 
why this is so exciting. I hope kind of the, the setting is clear. Um, so we study groups by their actions on trees. And now I give you some real examples. Well, this is also a real example, but maybe it's a uh, group acting on its uh, Kaylee tree is maybe not super exciting. Well, the next one will also be, anyway, um, we'll see some more examples in a second. So here's a much easier group, huh? the group with one generator, the integers, and the one generator is of course just one. And instead of writing A, 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 that's how words in the thing look like. I could just write three, for example. No, very, very simple group. And it acts, so the generator acts on a tree, on a very boring tree. Maybe I shouldn't go through the headline. On a very boring tree, or on a very simple tree, maybe I should call it boring. Name is the line itself um, by translation, right? That's the action of the generator. It's really just this action here. So I will give this generator a color, it will be red. This one will be red exactly in, as in this color code here, and this one will be blue. Okay, that's a, an action on a tree. Okay, we'll study that action in a second. Uh, but let's have another action on the same tree. And then now it's by the infinite dihedral group, which is not a very difficult group, but it's kind of fun. So this one is kind of a standard example that you see everywhere. It really just has two generators, and both generators square to one. So all words, all elements that you can write down in this group are always kind of alternating symbols of A's and B's. Why alternating? Well, because if you have AA, you could cancel AA, right? If you have BB, you could cancel BB. So just alternating symbols of A's and B's. Very simple group, alternating symbols. And it still acts on the same tree, but now the action, well, let me color one of the vertices red. So this is the red vertex here. And let me color the other vertex blue. Uh, this is a blue vertex. And the action is the red generator A acts by reflection along um, the red vertex and the blue generator B acts by reflection along the blue vertex. Uh, that's it. And then you can do A, B, A, B, A, B, A, B and you kind of always turn, reflect your, your line around. And now comes the main observation of bus cell theory. I think those are pretty cool and pretty simple actions in some sense. Uh, groups acting on trees. And if you quotient out by the group action of uh, the integers on this one, what will happen is, well, this point is identified with this point, is identified with this point, is identified with this point, and so on. So actually what you get is you wrap up a line into a circle, right? So the quotient is a circle, yeah? So because you identify points uh, of distance one, so you end up with a circle. And turns out, well, the quotient is a circle, that's great. And the quotient of this one here, if you think about it a little bit, is the following graph, an interval. So where our blue and our red vertex stay what they are. And we have just a line in the middle because this point here is identified with this point and this point is identified with this point. So eventually, um, but the blue point is only identified in every second step here. And the red point is only identified in every second step here. So we don't identify those two points and we end up at the quotient being the interval with one point being, uh, one endpoint being blue and one endpoint being red. And now comes the main observation, the fundamental group, well, there comes the topology of the circle is actually our acting group. So we can recover the group from its action. And that's fantastic. We always want to want to do that somehow because we're studying groups via the actions. Um, so we should be able to somewhat try to recover groups from the actions. However, for the other example, that doesn't work because um, the pi one of the inter interval is actually trivial. So it's certainly not our, our little group here. That's kind of bad. And all Basset theory wants to do is it wants to fix this problem. That's what we're trying to do. So we need to beef up the setting a little bit and we can fix this problem and then we can recover groups by their action on trace. We take the fundamental group of a certain object and comes out that turns out that this is our acting group. Very, very similar to this picture here, just kind of then in general for groups acting on trees. And I think that's pretty cool. So let's have a look at this action again because the other action is kind of okay. Um, so what we'll do is we still have our little quotient here, right? The, the red vertex and the blue vertex, but we remember a bit more information. We remember the stabilizers of everything. So the stabilizer of the blue point, the blue point is here. So the blue point is stabilized by the blue action. So I put a span of B here 
the red point is stabilized by the red action. So I just put span of A here. And turns out, and that's the main observation, if you want, of Basset theory, that our infinite dihedral group and the stabilizer here is one, uh, because nothing really stabilizes it. The infinite dihedral group, which is just A squared B squared equals one and no other relation, is the free product of those two guys, uh, of those two guys over this one. And that's a good indication because pi one, if you remember something like the Seifert and Van Kampen theorem, is then essentially about free products, right? You could think of cutting this thing here into two pieces and have uh, the free product here of this guy and this guy, and then we take the free product in the middle. That's kind of interesting. And that's exactly what Bastet theory does. It is about decorated quotients. And then they have a notion of a decorated fundamental group, and it will spit out your group itself, exactly by some version of Seifert and von Kampen theory. And that's my main statement, the fundamental theorem of a Basset theory, without really introducing all these notions, because it's a bit annoying. I will introduce the graphs, because that's kind of nice, but I, I'm not going to introduce the fundamental group. So let's just say there is a notion of a fundamental group. And with this notion of the fundamental group, we have a group G acting on a tree, yeah, and we have the quotient x, and ignore the base point. There's always a base point. Ignore the base point. Then there's a notion of a fundamental group of this quotient graph, and this this graph is called a graph of groups, which I'm going to explain in a second. It's really this beast here, the decorated graph. The fundamental group is the group itself, so we can recover the group from its action, which is absolutely fantastic, right? So it's kind of beefing up um, the usual topological relationship between a fundamental group and kind of covering spaces. And yeah, what is a graph of groups? I'm not going to explain the fundamental group here itself. You can do it. It's not so super difficult, but uh, you know, I only have so many minutes in a YouTube video. So anyway, um, the, the main book is absolutely great, by the way. It's linked in the description if you want to read it. It has a fantastic name. So it's by Sarah and has a, oh, well, uh, let me go back to the first slide because I'm probably butchering the name. It is by Sarah. Um, and it's very easy to Google because it's just called Trees. A uh, very fantastic name for a book, Trees. Um, the French version, so it's just the English version, just the translation of the French version, has a slightly different name, but I personally prefer the name Trees for its simplicity. So just Trees. <laughs> very great. Anyway, that's a great source. And if you want to look up the details, so that's highly recommended. Anyway, so the graph of groups is this decorated graph. Uh, like this one here, and I cheated a little bit. There's an orientation, uh, whatever. Let's ignore the orientation. It's a following. We decorate um, our vertices with groups, and we decorate our edges with groups. So we have vertex groups and edge groups. Right. So whenever you have an arrow um, between two vertices, then we have a, a certain well, a, a source group. Right, so GV, and we have a target group GW. And my edge group is just essentially a subgroup of those. Right, so in this case, one is a subgroup of those, and then we can somehow take uh, the free product of those. Fine, and that's essentially what it is. So we just have a, a notion of uh, groups per edge and vertex such that they are kind of successive subgroups in a certain way. And strictly speaking, there's an orientation. You might wonder why is there an orientation? Because for one side, you actually fix the nematic. But that's just what it is. But anyway, I would like to not try to think about that. Uh, it just turns up in the relations at the end. But the point is, you have groups associated to vertices and edges. And otherwise, it's just a topological quotient under your action. And the groups, you could think of them as being the stabilizers of the corresponding um, points. But this is kind of a general notion. So it doesn't refer to any action at all. It's just, uh, this is a, what it, whatever it means to be a graph of groups. And then you can have fundamental groups for those, you have the covering theory for those, and you can just play the usual topology game, which is pretty cool. And what you see here is this fundamental theorem of bus their theory. So you kind of recover the group from its actions, which is absolutely fantastic. The only kind of catch here is that we are acting on a tree. So higher dimensional actions somehow don't quite fit in this uh, theory. And I show you a cute application. So the main example, uh, uh, quite a fancy example, but certainly the main example is a modular group, uh, which is just this guy here. 
And so this, by the way, just copied from Seth's book. It's a beautiful book from the 80s with great illustrations and all that. It's really readable. Highly recommend it. Anyway, the modular group, SL2Z, not an easy group at all, huh? but it has kind of a well-known action on the upper half plane by Möbius transformations. And there's a, a tree associated to it, and eventually it will act on the tree. And what you can then do is, because you have some Seifert and the Van Kappen theorem, you can cook up, cook up a presentation of SL2, because SL2 will appear here via on this side, and on the other side, you will have an object that you usually study, um, kind of in topology using something like free products and so on. And you can show the kind of ridiculous statement um, that I find really, 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 really confusing <laughs> that SL2Z is isomorphic to, so this is SL2Z, is isomorphic to the free product of Z4 with Z6 over Z2. And that's <laughs> kind of, I, I'm not trying to imagine that in matrices, but it, it's actually not so difficult. Um, this was well known before. So Sarah calls this the classical isomorphism, whatever, but it kind of pops up from the, it just falls out of the theory. And you can do the same for other groups as well. So if you like PSL2 or something or GL2, uh, you can kind of play um, the same game. And roughly it works as follows. Uh, so let me go back to, to this picture. So there will be the fundamental group of such a picture usually will be the amalgamation, the, the product of those two, of the vertex groups here, over whatever you see in the middle. And that's essentially what's going on here as well. Um, so the generators are the elements of the vertex groups, and this is extra generator, which I'm going to ignore. And the relations are the relations of the vertex groups and some relations corresponding to that generator that I'm ignoring. But anyway, it's, it's really kind of a, a little bit beefed up version of this one here, where my middle thing that I'm ignoring is trivial. So I don't have anything extra. I just have this guy and this guy. And you can play the same game for many other groups, but not for all of them. And this is kind of the problem because for example, for SL3 already, you don't, don't want to lie. For SL3, usually you don't want to act on a tree, but on a higher dimensional object. And it's not so clear uh, how to do this. But otherwise, this is absolutely great. You can recover a group from its action and you can play around with the classical topology uh, tricks to get pr funny presentations of uh, groups, of quite complicated groups. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video and I also hope to see you next time.